Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to talk about redox reactions and assigning oxidation numbers. Now a redox reaction is where oxidation numbers undergo some sort of numerical change, either because I lost electrons or because I gained electrons. And so what happens is we have both the processes of oxidation and reduction taking place. And if you notice kind of the first letters of those names there, if I combine them together, that's where we get our overall name of a redox reaction. Now, reduction is what happens when we have a gain of electrons by a substance. And so when we gain those negative particles, what happens is that the oxidation number becomes more negative. Or if you think about oxidation number being on a number line, we would say that the oxidation number decreases on the number line. Um, for an oxidation, that's where we have a loss of electrons. Now, if I'm losing those negative particles, what that means is the oxidation number would become more positive, and so therefore the oxidation number would increase on a number line. It would venture more towards the positive end of the spectrum. Now, there's several different ways of remembering oxidation and reduction and which one does what. I happen to like the saying oil rig. I happen to live in Texas, and so we have oil rigs all over the place in Texas. And and if you've ever seen an oil rig or know how one works, what happens is that the oil comes up when the rig digs down into the ground. And so the way I use this is that I remember an oxidation is a loss of electrons, but that causes the oxidation number to go up. A reduction is a gain of electrons, but that causes the oxidation number to go down. So you can see it not only helps you know what happens with electrons, but also what happens with that oxidation number. Now here's the key thing. I can't have one of these processes happen without the other. I can't have one thing gain electrons if there's not something else that's losing them. So we'll always notice in an overall reaction these two processes happening in conjunction with each other. Now we need to clarify something before before we get too far into this, and that is the difference between oxidation number and charge. Um, if I have an ionic compound, the oxidation number is the very same thing as the ionic charges, and so therefore they're one and the same. But I can actually have oxidation numbers on things that are covalently bonded. So for example, like a covalent compound or even within a polyatomic ion. And so within those, I don't normally have a charge but I can show how the electrons are distributed within that substance. And so that's the goal of an oxidation number. Now what that means is that sometimes we end up assigning oxidation numbers to elements that are totally different than what their normal predicted charge would be. Because again, within a polyatomic ion or within a covalent compound, oxidation number is not the same as ionic charge. So keep in mind, even though you know a particular element has a set charge, you might have a totally different oxidation number for it. So don't always assume that those two are the same, okay? Now we do have some rules for assigning oxidation numbers. Um, and I know there's a lot of them, but you'll see as you start to use these more and more, you'll start to get more and more familiar with them, I promise. So first off, if we have an element by itself that's not shown with any kind of charge, it's just that element all on its own, we would assume that it's a neutral element, and so the oxidation number would be zero. Uh, by the way, this does include diatomic elements. So like if I have N2 or something like O3 ozone, or we have some weird ones like P4 and S8, if I see one of those ever, it's going to have an oxidation number of zero. Now, if I have a monatomic ion, the oxidation number is the charge. What that means, a monatomic ion is where I just have one element in that ion. So for example, if they show me sodium plus one, then I assume that the oxidation number is plus one. Now, sometimes they might show it as Na1+, or they could show just Na positive, since it's one, and we recognize that all of those mean exactly the same thing. So there's really no difference between those. So now let's talk about assigning compounds, because that's really where it starts to get kind of interesting on this. So first off, if we have a metal that's at the front 
of the compound. We assign it an oxidation number that's the same as its common ionic charge. Now, obviously, sometimes we have metals that have more than one possible charge, and so sometimes we have to use what it's with to figure it out. And so we can do those same exact things here like we did when we wrote ionic compounds. Now, if the metal is not at the front of the compound, we want to wait to assign it because there's a chance it could be something different than that normal ionic charge. And we'll see some examples of that here in just a little bit. So next, is fluorine in the compound? If it is, we assign it its normal charge of negative one, no matter what kind of compound it is. That oxidation number on fluorine will always be negative one. If hydrogen is in the compound, we usually assign it a positive one. However, let's say you had it with a metal and you have already assigned the metal its oxidation number. You might be forced to assign the hydrogen a different oxidation number depending on what it's with. So you notice it says here on a rare occasion it can be negative one if bonded only with a metal and a metal hydride such as lithium hydride. But keep in mind, if I was assigning this in order, I would have already assigned the lithium a positive one because it was the metal at the front of the compound. And as we'll see here in a little bit, this compound has the total out to be zero. And so by process of elimination, negative one is the only thing that hydrogen could be at that point. So we always wanna assign these in order. So next it says, hey, is oxygen in the compound? If so, we assign it an oxidation number of negative two unless it's with something else that we've already assigned first. So for example, it can be negative one if it's in what is called a peroxide group. Um, the best example we have of that is H2O2. But think about it for a minute. You would have already assigned the hydrogen as being positive one. There's two of it. So again, the only thing oxygen could be there is negative one if you're assigning an order. Same thing goes if it's with fluorine and OF2. If you've already assigned the fluorine as being negative one, then to balance that out, oxygen has to be a positive two. So on occasion, we can have some exceptions to these, but if we assign an order, we will catch those exceptions. Then we get to if any other nonmetal is at the end of a compound, we assign it an oxidation number that is the same as its common ionic charge. So once I've assigned that thing at the end, if there's anything else left in there, say maybe we had some sort of element kind of in the middle of the compound, then we use the guidelines that elements in a polyatomic ion must combine to be the charge of the polyion, or elements in an overall compound must combine to be zero or neutral. And like I said, we're going to work through several examples on this, so hopefully by the end of this you'll feel confident. However, I do want to kind of give you a, a quick way of remembering uh, the order of which we assign in our compounds. So if I'm assigning a compound, I always want to go with, in the order of metals, at the front, then fluorine negative one, then hydrogen plus one, then oxygen negative two, and then non-metal at the end. And then I can go back and assign anything else that I may have. So again, metals at the front, fluorine negative one, hydrogen plus one, oxygen negative two, and then non-metals at the end. That is the order that you would want to work in. So let's go through some examples of this so we can see how this would work. So it says here, hey, for each of the following substances, assign oxidation numbers to each element. Well, let's start off with a couple easy ones. Sodium by itself. I notice it's not shown with any kind of charge to it. I notice that it's not included as part of a compound. And so therefore my oxidation number here would simply be zero. It's neutral sodium all by its lonesome. All right, next one, Cl2. Even though it's diatomic, I notice it's still an element by itself. And so what happens is nobody's pulling on these electrons more than another. Everything's kind of be sharing here equally. And so therefore I assign an oxidation number of zero. So again, elements by themselves with no charge being shown, we assume their oxidation numbers to be zero.
So now let's look at this next one here, Na2CO3. So let's go through our rules, our guidelines. I have a compound, and so the first thing I would do is I would assign the metal that's at the front of this compound. I know that sodium is in group one, and any group one metal should always have a charge of positive one, and so therefore it should have an oxidation number of positive one. Now I do notice there's two of them though, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make myself a little note that there's two of those because that's going to help me kind of solve my math here in a little bit. So next, I look for fluorine. I don't have that. Next, I look for hydrogen. I don't have that. Next, I look for oxygen. And I'm like, ooh, we do have that. So I assign oxygen negative two, but I notice that there's three of them. So I'm gonna put myself a little note that there's three of those. Now, here's the deal. I have a compound here, not shown with any kind of overall charge or anything like that. And so I'm gonna assume that overall, this needs to all add up to being zero. Okay, so what that means is that when I go now and assign carbon, I need to assign carbon something that will cause all of this math to come out and equal zero. Well, oxygen, that negative two times three, that would be negative six. So what that means is that I'm gonna need from the sodium and the carbon together a positive six. Well, right now I have positive one times two, so that would be positive two. So what that means is that that carbon in the middle has to be here a positive four. That is the only way that all of this can total up to being zero. Now, I know I made these little notes here about my math just to kind of help me see what's going on. But if a problem ever asked you to state what the oxidation numbers are for the elements, I would say that sodium is positive one, carbon is positive four, and oxygen is negative two. You notice if I'm assigning an oxidation number, I wanna assign it for one of that element. I still wanna think about the fact that there's multiples of that element in there to help me figure out the overall of what's happening, but I still wanna assign those numbers for one of that element. All right, let's look at FeNO3 too. Um, first off, I notice it is an ionic compound, and so I'm gonna assign the metal at the front first. However, iron is something that can have more than one possible charge, and so I need to use what it's with to figure out what this iron is. I notice that I have nitrate here, and I know nitrate has a negative one charge, um, and there's two of these nitrates. So that means for this ionic compound to be balanced, this Fe's charge had to have been a positive two, which is also going to be its oxidation number. All right, so next I would look for fluorine. I don't have that. I look for hydrogen. I don't have that. I look for oxygen. I'm like, ooh, I do have that. Um, and I know that oxygen is typically negative two. However, I need to address how many I have. I notice I have three times two. So I have six of these. So that means I have a grand total here of negative 12. So that means I'm gonna need positive 12 to cancel it out. So I have this nitrogen here, but remember, I wanna assign for one of that element. And right now there's two of it in there. So I'm gonna put myself a little note here that whatever this number is, it's gonna get multiplied by two when I'm doing my math. And so if I think, well, I need a positive 12, there's already positive two here. So that means I need positive 10 to come from the nitrogen. So that means nitrogen is gonna to need to be a positive five. And so that way, all of this can tally up together to overall be zero. You notice I have positive two, positive five times two, which is positive 10, and then the negative 12. So again, that would all cancel out to zero. But again, if I was to state what these oxidation numbers were, I would say that Fe was a positive two, the nitrogen was a positive five, and the oxygen was a negative two. 
Those are my assigned oxidation numbers. So just be really careful if you're asked a question, hey, what's the oxidation number? Make sure you're only putting that oxidation number for one of that element. Be very careful with that. All right, let's look at these two examples. They're kind of tied together. You notice one is SO2 without a charge and one is SO2 with a charge. Uh, let's do the one without a charge first. So again, I have a compound, but I don't have a metal at the front. And so I keep on going through my rules. I don't have fluorine. I don't have hydrogen, but I do have oxygen. So I'm going to assign the oxygen a negative 2. But again, there's two of those in there. And so since I want this to all tally out to be 0, what that means is that my sulfur must be a positive 4 to cancel that out. So again, on this one, your sulfur is going to be a positive 4. Your oxygen is going to be a negative 2. However, on this one, I have a polyatomic ion. I have hyposulfite here. And I need the overall oxidation number to tally to this negative 2. That negative 2 is going to be kind of like my overall goal here instead of adding all up to 0. So I'm going to assign like I normally would. I don't have a metal at the front. I don't have fluorine. I don't have hydrogen. I do have oxygen. So I'm going to assign that negative 2. And there's 2 of them. So here, if this is negative 4, but I want to all add this up to be a negative 2, what that means is that here my sulfur is just going to be a positive 2. So I would assign sulfur as positive 2, and my oxygen I would assign as negative 2. Uh, by the way, um, all of these other ones that I did with polyatomic ions, you could technically do in that same way. For example, if I ignore this sodium here for just a second, and I think about carbonate, I know that carbonate overall has a negative 2 charge to it. So that means the individual oxidation numbers should add up to that negative 2. And I could see that a negative 6 and a positive 4 would add up to negative 2. So you could see that even for those ionics that have a poly ion, you could kind of pull out that polyatomic ion and, and do it separately on its own. Kind of a choice is yours there on that. All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to pause this video and go try out the other six examples that I've left you with. All right, so go try them out. Pause that video. Did you try them out? I hope you did. I'm going to go ahead and put my answers up here. Now, I didn't write down the individual elements. I just put the assigned oxidation numbers in a darker color. So for PCl3, um, if I went through my rules, I didn't have a metal at the front. I didn't have fluorine. I didn't have hydrogen or oxygen. So I assigned the non-metal at the end first. And I know chlorine is typically a negative 1. There's three of those, and so therefore to cancel out to zero, uh, the P must be a positive three. This is a great example where we have something that has an element that is not the normal charge. Like we know P being in group 15 is normally negative three for its charge, but remember, oxidation number is different than charge. We saw that on these polyions too. Look at nitrogen, positive five, or carbon positive four, those are not their normal charges. Because again, these are oxidation numbers and not charges. So be really careful with that. All right, HClO3, um, if I was doing this, I would have assigned the hydrogen first at positive one, then the oxygen at negative two times three. I want this to all tally out to zero, so chlorine would have been a positive five. KMNO4, I would have assigned the potassium at the front first, so that would have been positive one. Oxygen at the end is negative 2 times 4, so that would be negative 8. And so therefore, to cancel this all out to 0, the manganese must have been a positive 7. Here on NH4 positive 1, I want this to all add up to that positive 1 charge. And so therefore, if I was assigning here, I would have assigned the hydrogen first at positive 1, and there's four of those. And so to balance that out, the nitrogen would have had to be a negative 3 for this to all tally out to positive 1. CH4, if I was going through my rules, um, I don't have a metal, I don't have fluorine, but I do have hydrogen. And so I would have assigned the hydrogen at positive 1. There's four of them. And so the carbon must have been a negative 4 to balance out to 0. Last but not least down here, this one was kind of the tricky one, so hopefully you caught it. If you went in order of your rules, um, you should have assigned the metal at the front first. The metal at the front is positive 1. And so for this to all tally out to 0, the hydrogen here 
had to be a negative one. There was no other choice for it. So this is one of those metal hydrides that's an exception to the hydrogen rule. So again, as long as you assigned an order, you should have caught that exception to the rule. All right, hopefully we're feeling confident with assigning oxidation numbers. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.